Okay, thank you for waiting, those of you who were on time. We appreciate your patience. And as we start this second of our seminar webinars, what if webinars we're calling them, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, particularly for where we meet at Vimiac, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay our respects to the Indigenous people in all the places that we are meeting on today. And thank them for their patience with us and their graceful understanding of how, if I could just put it in a word, stupid we are for not listening to them. Um, they have looked after this land, kept it safe and sacred for over 60,000 years and we have not been wise enough to listen to their teachings. So I really want to acknowledge them and acknowledge any Indigenous people who are with us today. I would also like to acknowledge people with lived experience of mental illness who are with us today. So, just a little bit of introduction before I introduce Sally. This is, um, as many of you now know, um, a use of the technology that's now available to us. And this is the second in our What If webinars. We are doing these webinars because uh, the late last year, we decided that instead of continually talking about the problems in the mental health system, which we had written in detail and sent to the Royal Commission, we wanted to tell them what needs to be there and what the system would look like if it was working well for us. And so the consultations that we've run this year and this webinar series is to help us do that and to identify what would be really good if it was working well. And this particular webinar is what if it was working well uh, for transgender people in particular. Uh, last week it was what if it was working well for and consumers were designing it themselves. We have another five webinars which I uh, will invite you to look at the website and book into. But today we particularly want to look at what if the system were working really well for transgender people. And Sally has been willing to speak I just want to read a little bit of the introduction um, for Sally uh, and just uh, ask you to mute your microphones. Uh, with a small group, it's okay if you don't mute the video. Otherwise, Sally will be talking to a blackboard and it's better to have some faces for her to talk to. Uh, we will invite you to go to the chat room uh, if you look at the bottom you can put yourself into the chat room and if you have thoughts or ideas as you go while Sally's speaking there will be a time at the end for questions and Emily will identify questions and either read them out to Sally or uh, get you to speak yourselves and if we don't have time to cover all the questions then uh, we will ask Sally to make some comments and we will put them on the website. This uh, webinar will be on our website later and uh, some of the questions and some of the discussion will also be on the website. It will also go into our submissions to the Royal Commission. So it is both a chance for us to learn and a chance for us to take this further into the conversations with the Royal Commission. Sally's human experience as a trans and bi woman who can examine a situation from different perspectives due to her natural high levels of empathy and, and understanding of mental health issues. She had no words to describe her sense of gender identity until just prior to her being 30. 
and learning about and claiming the various aspects of her whole self as a commitment to growth has been an expanding of her skills, her understanding of the world and her understanding of herself. She claimed her bisexuality, introversion and cyclothermania and the trait of a highly sensitive person. And simply being herself is a story that is extremely valuable. Sally's skills of vision and strategic planning saw her deciding to put them into the law and policy reform in 1997 and she became a member of Transgender Victoria in 1999. I think she was a founding member. Sally has since provided education to hundreds, maybe thousands of people through her seminars, workshops and information sessions. And she has been an advisor to the Victorian government, to a number of other organisations in local government, in education and in the health area, particularly in mental health. We know that what Sally is going to talk about today will be both informative and inspiring. And we thank her for her time, not just today, but for the time she gives to this cause over many months and years. Thank you, Sally. And thank you so much for being part of this webinar series and for sharing your expertise. Thank you for that warm introduction and also thank you to Emily and also I'm not sure if she's joined the call but to Robin for the introductions and their setting up of everything today. And I have just popped in and shared a PowerPoint which I'm happy to send on to, um, to uh, Emily afterwards so I don't have to scribble too copiously because I'm also not going to cover everything in it. I very too acknowledge the, oh, sorry, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on whose lands we meet. I'm on the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and um, um, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that the land was stolen and never ceded. Something that I do in a presentation such as this is acknowledge that the language is very much of a Western or Anglo-Saxon nature, and there have been all sorts of ways to do gender identity and expression on all of the earth since humanity began, including in some parts of this continent, people such as sister girls and brother boys. And we very much acknowledge um, those peoples and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Um, just a few other things, if mobiles could stay on silent or other devices. Um, group agreement um, is just a few things there. Um, pop the questions in um, to the chat box as suggested. Also, um, I know it can be you know, um, challenging at times to type fast. Um, so if you just want to put, I, I have a question, we can probably go with that as well. I'm also happy if, I don't know if it's going to work if people want to pop them through to me privately. So rather than sending to everyone, you can just click on that, look for me and send them through to me. The other thing though that is the most critical point, sometimes people are, um, the main thing is that questions come and this may sound incredibly obvious, but I'll explain why, people, that the questions come from a place of learning. And I say that because sometimes people don't ask questions because they're scared they're going to get a word wrong. They'll say transgender instead of transsexual or whatever it is. Please don't worry about that. Give it the best shot. And when we get to questions either at the end and also if any need following up later, um, the, good, the way we look at that is you get what I call a bonus set of cutlery. Not only do you get the answers, you get a better way to frame the question as well. And that means you can learn from me rather than having to do that um, in a session with someone. I am really sorry, but I've got a problem here. I'm just going to have to go away for a second.
think that might be Sally's dog. Oh. Hashtag working from home. Um, <laughs> um, dog wants to bang on door from main area of house into where my study is. Now the door is open, hopefully won't be a problem. Um, so yeah, if you've got questions, don't worry about getting a word wrong and just give it your best shot. And as I say, you get a bonus set of cutlery at no extra cost because you'll get not only the answer, but how to ask the question as well, you know, or frame it in a better way if you're working with a client. And yeah, today is professional development, not about changing anyone's views or values. I think a critical thing is that it fleshes out your existing skill bases of what I call individual centered care. You've got all those skills, whether it's listening, empathy, counseling, call them what you will, um, just a matter of um, building on those. The legal backup, sometimes very quickly we get asked this. Um, if, you know, for example, in the waiting room of a, a, a health practice, someone says something to a transgender person that is probably offensive and you go over to that person and say, hey, we're an inclusive service where we work, um, please stop that. And they say, no, oh, not that politically correct stuff. This is your legal backup. We're covered around the country by the Sex Discrimination Act. And the Sex Discrimination Act also is more thorough in its definition of gender identity, the main focus of trans and uh, um, uh, the, the conversation today than most state and territory law, and also federal law overrides state or territory if there's a clash anyway. Three parts, I'm not gonna go through all of um, the others, just maybe um, focus on one other other than trans, um, define that experience, and then how we can change it. Sometimes people hear about the LGBTIQA and plus communities, that is the full list. I think most people are aware of lesbian, gay, bisexual. I've put definitions in of all of those. Um, just very quickly though on some of them. Queer can be a coverall for both sexual orientation, which is this slide, or, and romantic orientation, and issues to do with gender. Um, it is an age variation word, but the critical thing is whatever, if someone gives you the term they use in these areas, go with it. It's a great rapport builder. So if someone says to you, um, I'm a trans woman, don't say, oh, you're queer. You just use the term trans woman when communicating with them and about them. This is something we would love. What if practice was inclusive? Well, there's a tip already, even with the basics of definitions. Um, the two that maybe people haven't heard of, but are really important for trans people are asexual and aromantic. Some people have little to no sexual attraction, but have romantic attraction and some, um, you know, in simple terms, the other way around, but it is of course often more complex than that. One that perhaps people haven't um, thought a lot about, and this is not trans, and this is why I've deliberately put it on a separate slide. Intersex is not an issue of trans, it's where people have um, clearly identifiable, in identifiable physical sex characteristics that do not fit medical norms for male or female bodies. It is not my lived expertise, not my focus for today. And um, I would add that, um, you know, sort of intersex human rights Australia um, is the um, main organisation in Australia dealing with that. I will just put into the chat box IHRA and intersex, because if you don't put in intersex, you get the International Hot Rod Association. I'm sure there are some people with intersex variations who drive fast cars, but it um, shows that diversity does exist. Seriously, um, this is an issue that doesn't get a lot of coverage. I wish I had more time to talk about it today, but um, better that um, people with the lived expertise talk to the issues. Um, the PAPS um, two people pictured. One is Tony Briffer, who is a councillor on the city of Hobsons Bay and a lifelong Altona resident. The other is Casta Semenya, um, South African runner, both of whom are, well, one was open by choice about having an intersex variation, the other, I would hasten to add, was outed by a Sydney newspaper, had their medical um, privacy breached. So, yeah. Just a couple of people there, but um, again, time limits us today in terms of talking about that more, but 
intersex often are even less understood than trans. Sometimes in our in our training sessions, the first question we get, even after we've just after done the knowledge of country, is I've never heard the word before. Perhaps one more thing, then I'll say that I'm going to say a word and then throw it out immediately. The word hermaphrodite was used, but not appropriate. But sometimes that's how people can connect to that. So getting more into um, trans and gender diverse as we like to call it, and I'll explain why that definition is there. Trans and gender diverse people, we've gone with the definition, differ from society's expectations. So society's expectations are lumped on us from the moment we're born, or just, just thereafter in 49% of cases where we hold the body up in the birth ward, male body, we assign the person male at birth, and then we expect that the sense of gender identity how a person will see themselves looking inwards will be male and outwards is turn someone's expression. We will, I'll use the word in inverted commas, masculine. 49% of bodies over here, female, female identity, feminine body. The other 2% are intersex, which I just uh, mentioned there, where the body um, in, you know, is visibly different at birth in terms of genitalia and other things that were on that slide. Uh, why we use umbrella term, there's sort of lots of reasons for that. It gives the image of a range of people with that common thread of differing from expectations, sheltering under an umbrella. And the umbrella has various parts. Don't have to have had a surgery to be trans. And in terms of mental health, it's not a relevant issue, really, in most cases doesn't make your treatment of the trans person, you know, to, to be an inclusive service provider any different. Um, don't have to have taken hormones. You also don't necessarily have to have permanently affirmed another um, a, a sense of gender identity, um, sometimes called social, social transition. Um, so there's those ways of looking at it. And then there's three broad groupings um, that are different again. And um, as much as there's not going to be a lot of interaction in the first few minutes of this, if you do think you recognise any of those people, you can pop it in to the chat box. Um, but I'll keep going with them anyway. Person on the left is someone assigned male at birth who's always had a sense of female identity, being Georgie Stone, who is a 20-year-old trans woman living right here in Melbourne and who is currently having a permanent role on Neighbours, which is wonderful. And recently, a couple of episodes that are probably still on 10 Play, the equivalent of iView and similar, or one where she had a sort of pride gathering where Courtney Act made an appearance. And last Friday, I think it was, um, whereby she helped a parent of a young trans person with the, journey, the family's journey. I'll also, give you lots that I'm um, sending through later, or you can look it up on Transgender Victoria's website at tgv.org.au. There's a huge research resource list for trans people and families around Victoria. Um, so yeah, Georgie Stone is someone who was assigned male and really identified as female, same as myself, which I'll come to in a minute. And I use for the term myself the term trans woman. I'm not sure what Georgie uses, but um, um, you know, each one person's term again is their own. A group that sometimes gets massively overlooked are trans men, someone assigned female at birth, really with a sense of male identity. And I've picked possibly one of the world's most well-known trans men is a reasonable comment being Chaz Bono, um, child of Sonny and Sher. And on the right, is a group that's getting attention, but perhaps faces greater challenges in, a, in some ways, and that's people whose sense of identity is other than male or female. And I've used the picture of Ruby Rose, and uh, who uses the term gender fluid. Other terms in that third grouping are non-binary, gender diverse, gender queer, to name a few, agender, um, really, you know, are all terms that get used. Um, also, Ruby Rose was due to play Catwoman, has now withdrawn from the role, 
I'm still awaiting a response to my application to take it over. Whether that uh, I'm checking my email inbox every 10 minutes, no, not quite true, every hour. Um, so yeah, three broad groupings. Critical thing is everyone's term is their own. One term that's worth the mention is the word transsexual. And you know, mainly a word used by older and what I'll call middle bracket um, of age people, but um, not so much, if at all, amongst younger people. There is some, you know, people saying you can't use it. You can't tell someone who's had a heartfelt connection to a term, it might have been what saved them to stop using it, but it probably will fade in usage as time goes on. Um, so, um, yeah, three broad groupings, all equally important all with say varying challenges and in life and that sort of thing. The invisibility of trans men, for example, is a big one, but it can also lead, um, you know, sort of um, to other, other, that can be an advantage if um, you're in a hostile situation, but let's get rid of the hostile situations, I suppose. Um, so three broad groupings. Here is a wonderful slide does many things it proves that unicorns exist because proof research and visual seeing something is proof there is a unicorn well does also lots of other things um, this slide uh, they're a very cute unicorn and I've used they because we don't know what gender the person that unicorn is so we'll go with that as a gender neutral pronoun which is a handy tip uh, but it also gives me a chance to tell you my story which I have to say, often can be a whole hour in itself. I call that my extended dance mix um, personal story, which covers everything. Today, I'm going to use this as a guide to focus on mental health and where I've been and, um, you know, sort of, um, um, you know, sort of what might have made it better, what if, um, in line with our series. So the story starts at 16 October 65, um, where if you look in the middle of that slide, I was assigned male at birth. I have no reason to believe anything else um, was appropriate, certainly not female and no reason to believe other and intersex. Now imagine if these dots could move um, all the way, that one down to what I'll call the zero end, society would have assumed I could not have a female identity and that I'd have to be male, that one would move up the other end. And certainly not other genders, it'd be pretty similar for gender expression, maybe a little more, you know, towards the middle of those two lines. And these two, sexual orientation, not our focus for today, whoops, um, would be, you know, the men and other genders would be zero, and only women for both that and romantic to whatever degree. And so, um the question uh, sorry the thing that comes in there is that's okay maybe for the first four years of life early child care is pretty sort of gen open regender my trouble started on day one at school um, where i remember i'll see if i can line my fingers up to the web webcam here walking up to the door of the classroom and almost going out the door backwards because i spent all 13 years at an all boys school. I can laugh at it now and say it was an assumed all boys school. Um, they didn't quite get it 100% right. Seriously, it wasn't fun at the time. And there were a lot of, I just knew something was different on that first day. Of course, I didn't have an adult's knowledge and reasoning, but I knew something was happening. And yeah, there was a lot of um, competitiveness academically from both you know, the staff and from other students. There was a huge emphasis on team sport and playing it in what might be called a very masculine way. And that was never my thing. I'm not a reflex person, so batting at cricket wasn't fun. So I wear glasses. I have a turn in one eye. One eye goes directly ahead, being my right eye, my left eye's over there somewhere. So that's not very helpful if someone is hurtling a missile at you at 140 kilometres an hour. Um, in you know when you try and then you get want to run away from the ball and you get abused and but excuse the term here but yeah, you're playing like a girl and other things. Um, also, um, I as I passed puberty, 
it seemed that one leg developed a little shorter than the other. Well, that's not good for dodging tackles at football. Now, over, I don't like any generalisation, but it is a fair call to say in most cases, exercise is helpful for mental health. But because of that, I developed anxiety around any sort of exercise or body movement. And it was just this constant forcing of playing the same team sports, cricket in summer, football in winter in simple terms. Um, so, yep, uh, not a good start to life. I then, um, when I finished school in 1982, I went on to university. I studied commerce majoring in account and accountancy and worked in a corporate setting for around nine, eight or nine years. And it is, again, a reasonable thing to say that accounting can be very male and or masculine dominated. It wasn't a good fit. And my mental health was not helped. Um, added to that in the latter part of that time, I worked for a very difficult manager. One of those managers who had two traits. One, they're an absolute control freak who told you how to do everything. And two, because they had a higher up in a hierarchy, you had to do everything their way and you couldn't argue, which was not good for mental health for anyone. Um, but it certainly didn't help me. And in the end, I burned out and travelled for three months, which was great to restore uh, my mental health on the surface. But now we're at 1995 and we get right into the real issues of mental health in that um, I had always been aware, as I say, of this something that I knew from age four, didn't know what it meant. It had sort of be um, begun to push its way up, bubble its way up a bit like a you know, lava in a volcano crater or something, call it what you will. And I began to try to track down information. And this is still a big issue. Yes, I'll come to where things can you know, compare and contrast. We had internet in 1995. Who remembers dial-up? Been wondering over the last few months. I don't think um, dial-up would have handled these um, video conferences that we've all been doing. Uh, the thing was, at that point, it was still relatively new and not a lot of information to be found on anything, including why did I want to look, in inverted commas, look like a woman? That was all I knew at that time. Here's a big, big one. I tried. Thank. With the my, I told my local GP about this. He referred me to a psychiatrist, um, and the psychiatrist kept trying to find out, well, what was happening in your life when you first remembered this. At this point, I, my earliest memory of it was about six, and I didn't find out till four years later that was conversion therapy. So there is a big what, um, big no, a big don't. Um, you know, don't try to get someone to justify themselves, just affirm them for who they are, which again ties into basics of good practice, but certainly in terms of gender identity, just be affirming, reaffirming of that person in the present moment. It is so critical. Um, finally, thankfully, with the, um, by dumb luck, and there's something, no mental health should be as a result of dumb luck or good luck or just lucky strokes to be to use a more appropriate word i apologize for that word actually that's um ableist um the thing that i would say is um um in terms of that was i tracked down a psychologist who knew what she was talking about she was up to date she listened for the she could i walked in she could see i was in a not in a good way in terms of distress and she just listened and um, said, you can make me draw a family tree diagram or ask my history of substance abuse. She just let me get it out and then said, well, has anyone explained this to you this way? There's people called, her exact words were, some people are transgender, that means they could be more feminine than masculine or need to be female and not male. And that was obviously framed for someone like myself as a trans woman and the light bulb came on. So just having that basics of information, the more informed you can get on trans, that is a helpful thing. And so life turned around. I lived for two and a half years very quickly as a cross-dresser. So you could say both of those were in the middle. These began to find truer levels. In the next couple of years, I worked out my sexuality, to use my words, were bi and pansexual. 
Um, so that is about right, and that's eventually where that ended up. These could all be higher, um, and that's a very quick aside. 1998, though, that is that block of blue lines was who I always was. And I got to a critical point, I call it a realisation, whereas if I didn't live that way, I'd be in a lot of stress. And this is a critical factor where society, you know, forces us north so, or south, so to speak, and we know in our heart of hearts we have to go north. Um, that's what it causes, I think, a significant chunk of mental health, trying to live as someone we're not. Not being authentic or inauthentic is so problematic. But where we can get support and safely be ourselves, it can turn around. I will send through some extra slides which list some research and there's a survey from 2014 in both Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic and it found that 81% of trans people had thoughts of suicide before we could start being ourselves. Now that doesn't necessarily mean surgery or anything else just before when we're trying to live the wrong way. The figure for after we got on the right path Four percent. You know, just that support is so critical for us. So please um, take that as a take home from this. And I can happily say that after 1998, um, you know, in early 2000s, when getting these foundations right, other things came in. The introduction mentioned that I was, I will use the term, recognised with have experiencing cyclothymia. I don't really like the word diagnosed myself. I feel that is a bit medically pathologising. And it's been helpful to understand that. And over time, I've managed it more. So rather than having peaks and troughs sort of like that, it's now a bit, I'm not going to start off screen, it's much gentler and, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of, longer term peaks and troughs than more short term ups and downs and it's now largely manageable but I still have to be very aware of it and not that it gets set off. Um, I would also add aside from transgender that cyclothymia for some reason doesn't seem to be recognised very often. I don't know why that is but if it's there why not because it has been helpful to know about that and then have a base from which to work. Um, yeah, um, and other things that have happened since, and this is an example in a way of good practice um, in terms of exercise. No one ever asked me at school, what would be good for you? And in, I didn't want to compete and win races and get better batting averages or whatever, but two years ago, full credit to the city of Darabin in Melbourne's inner north, they had a trans swim night. And I just thought I'll go along, splash around in the pool, talk to people who are there. I just thought I'll do a couple of laps. And there it was. Think about that. I'm horizontal. If I've got one leg shorter than the other, it doesn't matter. Why I'm going to bash my head on the side of the pool. Well, I won't. I can still see well enough to know where I'm coming to the end of the lap. And I've got to say in the last few months where we had severe lockdown, not being able to go to the pool was, in, was very tough. I lost a huge support. But this is a great case of working through someone on an individual basis. Okay, you don't like walking and running because your legs are different lengths. I should say I fixed that with the help of a chiropractor who just said, why don't you put a lift in one shoe and gave me one and the rest is history. Um, just listening. It sounds so obvious, but we don't do it often enough. We have come in with our own agendas on so many things. And I wish for trans people this didn't happen. And, yeah, um, I also, as was mentioned, I haven't got time to cover it today, knowing parts of my neuroprocessing as someone who, despite the fact I'm going to be largely talking non-stop for an hour, and those who know me know that I do that, and I'm passionate about it. I am an introvert. I'll need my quiet time. Um, introverts get very, appear like extroverts when we're talking about something that really matters because um, it comes from deep within. We, we, fool, we fool people. Um, but I've got to say, I can be a little dry humid over the last few months um, with the lockdown. I've managed reasonably well because there's an old meme that says introverts of the world unite quietly together in our own homes via the internet. And so I have managed okay. But I do miss the supports that I usually have where they are external. Um, also, the highly sensitive person trait. This is um, my particular trait. And when I say mine, it's my unit story here. And we also have a bit of an old joke in the trans community. Um, if you hear one trans story, 
you've heard one trans story. Because of course we are all unique in any aspect. Um, but there are some common threads, I suppose, that we didn't have information. But some research Transgender Victoria did or focus groups, um, you know, that um, we ran. 50% of trans people said their neuroprocessing in whatever form, HSP, sensory deprivation, whatever this is important to them. So really, I think be aware of that. Um, and if someone perhaps appears uncomfortable, or maybe even if they don't, if you want to be proactive, check in with them and say, are there, um, if it's, if you, you know, is it okay to ask, you know, um, what parts of you are important so I can really give you the best service? We'd really like that a lot. Um, so your life's turned around just when people listened and gave me, to use that term, individual centred care, connection, support, visibility, the themes that come out of my story. Just touched on this, intersectionality, a term coined by a woman of colour in the USA, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, but it can very much apply here for all factors of a person. Um, I've touched on neuroprocessing, um, but all these things are important. But um, something that perhaps goes beyond my, getting off my story, past and present sex workers, two thirds of people who work in the sex industry are LGBTIQA plus, including trans. So be knowledgeable about sex workers as well. And I'm gonna pop in the peer-based sex worker group's name in Victoria. Um, that can be an issue of where um, sex workers don't get support. Um, trying to be an ally, one issue they face is people want to rescue them from sex work when they could be quite happily doing it. So there's an issue. So you could be knowledgeable on trans, but if you get it wrong on sex work, then the person won't come back to the service. Age issues. Um, a few things here. Schools are physically the least safe space, according to the research. Some people say, what about cyberspace? Well, no, not great, but still the research from, as it's now called Rainbow Health Victoria, uh, points out schools are problematic. Can I come out at home? Sadly, too many young people are thrown out of home for being trans and then trying to get appropriate accommodation, given that it's gendered, is a big issue. And I, do, I don't have a better term than youth phobia, um, but it does exist, sadly, um, um, in that, um, you know, sort of, um, there's this whole, you know, your, your, your attitude against young people, you're too young to know, dear, that sort of thing, you know, and you don't understand that at all, you know, um, which is, I've demonstrated by my story, which shows that you can be aware of, you know, gender, identity at a very early age, even if you don't have the information. I sometimes call youth phobia awareness fairy syndrome, that the awareness fairy will come along the night before your 18th birthday and sprinkle awareness over you so you'll understand your gender magically the next day. Of course, that can't be logical. That's what it is. A bit of a sleeper issue here, the middle cohort, which I'll define roughly as 30 to 55, is that um, whilst there's been good progress for gay and lesbian, it's still not easy for trans and gender diverse and for that matter, bi people, um, some every, everywhere, particularly perhaps as you get more into regional and rural, multicultural and faith. Um, you, know, you know, things have progressed for gay and lesbian, which is great, but it's not the same thing. And also some middle cohort of age people, the anecdotal evidence says that they can lose the support they have um, from the first part of their life, particularly trans women who then suddenly have less support. And that's the anecdotal evidence from on the ground from the councillors where our building, where our office is when we're usually there, being Drummond Street Services and or um, from other services such as job network agencies. So, yep, very important to acknowledge that sometimes we think, oh, the middle cohort can look after themselves, it'll all be great. Not necessarily so. And then issues for seniors, um, Alzheimer's and dementia is not an issue in itself, but it can lead to a loss of control, self-control, which means someone could, who let's say has lived as a male all their life, might suddenly say to a partner of 50 years, I always thought I was a woman, wow. Um, so, you know, that's um, something that could happen. Or a trans woman, let's say in an aged care setting who 
hasn't told anyone about the first part of her life. Um, we call, that's one meaning of the word we use called stealth, that you don't want to talk about yourself. Um, that can be an issue um, as well. And suddenly, you know, the person outs themselves or they're forced into a situation in an aged care setting where in an activity group, hey, today, everyone, we're going to draw ourselves at five years old, 10 years old, 15, etc. Well, that could out someone. The way you could change that is to say, what music were you listening to at five years old, 10 years old? And I'll go, well, not that I was listening at five years old, but the music was around. I'll mention Jimi Hendrix all along the Watchtower and the Rolling Stones give me shelter. At 10, it'll be Skyhooks and Sherbet and 15, it'll be Midnight Oil and Cold Chisel and on we go. And now you've just all left the, left the webinar because you don't like my music taste and I haven't even mentioned country and western. That's too much diversity. That's really going to push it. Seriously, um, find ways to be inclusive and win-win for all. The myths of Alzheimer's and dementia is that I will go back to being a male or a trans man will go back to being female. No, it won't. No, check with Alzheimer's Australia on that. What could happen, though, is if we, in the first part of our life, faced a lot of stress and anxiety for um, trying to not be out or facing transphobia, we might go back to that time. That could be a possibility, but we don't have evidence of it yet. Issues that we face. Um, sorry, needs a space in there. Um, cisgender, cis is Latin for on the same side as. Um, so um, that's where your gender identity fits expectations. It's a better way than saying not transgender. So about 95 to 98% of people on this call, you can go home tonight, come out to your household as cisgender, and they'll probably still be very valuing of your lifestyle choice. Now that's a bit um, silly, but seriously, it's just a better way to put it. Issues we face, having some gender neutral or all gender toilets in your service is really important for trans and gender diverse people. Still keep some women's only one. We totally respect that women can feel unsafe in a lot of settings. Um, clothes shopping, there's still a few stores around where you've got male changing rooms and female changing rooms, which for those people who identify as other than male or female is uncomfortable. But for anyone at the point, just as we're starting out our affirmation, that can be harder as well. And things that have happened, people have woken up in hospitals and been put in the wrong bed, or even if they've filled out paperwork before going in for a planned operation, we've had stories of a trans woman ending up in a male ward because someone, because the person hadn't had surgery. And these are not issues that affect you in your practice directly, but some trans, a trans person might tell you a story of this. Good to see also lots of resources around the country for sex workers. I might just throw in one more a national organisation called Scarlet Alliance. Oh, I haven't quite spelled that right, but you get the, the gist. Um, here are some biggies. Using name and pronoun correctly. Um, you know, don't assume anything about our gender identity and use the term that the top part the person has used. If it's relevant to us, you can ask and then just take that. If you, It might be you want to refer someone on to another service. Let's say they are homeless and you know of a homeless service. Oh, look, um, Sally, um, we know this service. Do you mind if I write an email to my friend there? Um, and I say, yeah, sure. And you'll say, Sally has given me permission to write to you. She's a trans woman. Da, 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 da. Saves the person having to explain their term again. I'll come more to name and pronouns in a couple of slides. People have probably seen this or variations thereof. This is what we're trying to achieve, I suppose, in so much, um, including for trans people. The first frame is when we treat everyone the same. Well, that's no use to that person in the dark, the dark shorts on the right. The second frame is better, but it has two huge shortcomings. How does that person get up onto the second box? You know, does the, the other people have to move out of the way? Does someone lift them up? And the second shortcoming is that as a trained accountant, that is terrible workplace health and safety to have people standing on rickety wooden boxes. So can we find something better? Aha, I do like the overall image this conveys. What's the barrier to being inclusive? How can we get rid of barriers? So what if the service was inclusive to trans and gender diverse people and there were no barriers, it was equally um, inclusive as it would be for cisgender people? So that image there, we don't need boxes. 
Um, everyone's comfortably on the ground. They could be lying on their backs or stand, leaning, leaning on their elbow, whatever. It's a great image. It is also my permanent Facebook cover page, despite those things that come up and say, change your cover page. No, I like this one. Here we go to some ones that really start giving us hints that you're inclusive. Um, if you need, first thing always to ask is, do I need to collect gender identity? Well, I imagine for client statistics or staff and volunteer, um, you know, statistics you do. So the way to do that is to have gender, a blank line and optional. We see that on a form. And if you've done that and you put the form on your website, we're gonna go, aha, you're trying to make an effort. But if we just see male, female circle one, we're gonna go, oh, not so sure. Similar thing for if you want to collect the mailing title or honorific as it's called, blank line and optional. You've just covered everyone. So that could be the basic Mr. Ms., Mrs., Ms., etc. But it can also be Dr. Reverend, Reverend Jedi Knight, anything else. Um, if you have a Jedi Knight come into your service, please let me know. I'd love to meet them, but don't breach confidentiality in telling me. Um, the other thing about name, people often have not had a chance to change their name on a legal document, such as a birth certificate. It can cost $120.50. Um, and so having um, fields such as name in use or and name on legal document is really important. So a story that happened to me some years ago, right at the point of realisation, I was in a government department office was Centrelink, but uh, I'll, I'll start whinging about Centrelink or we'll never be out of here. Um, and I hadn't changed the name. I walked in, say, as I am now, and the when the person came to see me, Mr. Fred Goldner, are you there? Not that my name was Fred. You know, that's going to out someone, not good, instantly puts them out there as trans. So if you've got that name in use as the top thing there, um, and someone calls out Sally Goldner, yay, fantastic. Um, marker, yeah, we covered that. A lot of trans people do not um, stay in touch with what we call family of origin because of um, the family of origin, sadly, might not want to know them, or the trans person might not have the support from family of origin. Family of choice is really important to us. So having forms that have contact person, name, phone number, possibly other things like email address, and then relationship slash S to client. You've just um, opened it up to be inclusive. And then we can put friend in trans support group, housemate, um, whoever else. And there could be a person that has multiple roles. One of my two people in this area, if I was using a service, would have um, best one of best friends, no, um, um, person in by by um, by by, by organisation, executive power of attorney, medical attorney. You've just got a lot of information. Fantastic um, way of supporting. So having that, we look for that. And again, if you change the form and have those things and put them on the website, they're the little hints that work for us. Privacy, which I just touched on with that Centrelink thing, is more than just files. And recognise some of these days I've mentioned, put in there in particular, are ones that cover the trans day. I've mentioned bi because there's a huge crossover in terms of trans people who are attracted to more than one gender. If you recognise these days and do the work to be inclusive, we look for these things. They're a great way of communicating your support. Here in line with our theme, some do's and don'ts, keep focused on individual centred care. Be inclusive and communicate the work is done, such as celebrating the various days. Partner with trans people, thank you very much, you've done that today, and trans specific organisations are preferred. Be trauma informed. I don't think people are still quite aware of the level of trauma from the first part of our life and the discrimination that we face in it, and are including in all parts of the, you know, you know, sections of our life. Also, I'd add, though, be aware that lots of trans people do have positive, thriving lives and have all senses of humour and do strange things like listen to country and Western music. So seriously, be aware of the positives. And neuroprocessing, as I said, keep learning. I love this phrase. I'd heard about curious as a great quality for understanding diversity. But in these times, there's a phrase, you know, you know particularly as we have to confront maybe unconscious bias that I have with white privilege, be curious, not furious. <laughs> I really like what that says. 
and show support of the trans community. And what I mean by equalising use of pronouns, if you're not sure of someone's pronouns, we'd overwhelmingly prefer you to ask. And a good way to do that might be, and if I may, um, use someone on the call. So I'd say it's Emily and I walk into the service and Emily says, hi, I'm Emily. I use she, her pronouns. Which pronouns do you use, Sally? You've made it equal. It's not just a trans thing. Everyone's you know, aware of their pronouns. And that's really important. If you make a slip on someone's pronouns and it happens, and yes, I have done it because we've all got what I call um, gender programming to some extent, and so let someone correct you, that's fine, um, and just say, oh, thank you for that, apologies for getting it wrong, I'll make the effort to get it right from there on and make that effort, and we're okay on that too. If we see a service is making an effort, we will very much cling to the service. A couple of don'ts. Don't think because you know about gay and lesbian, you know about trans, they're not quite the same. Yes, there are some similarities in the prejudice we face, but it's not all the same. And don't ever say, oh, we're inclusive because we went in Mardi Gras and covered ourselves in glitter. That does not mean you're inclusive, as I've said there, eek. And don't assume gender is the only reason for us wanting support. It could be something else. If we're not there to talk about being trans, don't make us give you a free trans 101. And that's great that this is happening today because, um, you know, hopefully you'll have more hints. So keep learning. Put, you know, there's a, to adapt Desmond Tutu's saying about how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. Let's not eat elephants, they're too nice. Um, it'll, how to eat a watermelon one bite at a time. Take one hint from today and get, start working on it and then it becomes part of, the, part of the bloodstream. It's like changing habits. Just you've got to keep making the effort. And then it's goal setting timeframes and people. Um, we are just as much a part of all the diversity. Go back to that slide I mentioned, Dan Moore. Um, it's not about having people come out necessarily, just be inclusive. And as I said, we will cling to you, even if there's slips. Um, not too many, but you know, that sort of thing. And keep going. Some organisations who did done work in this area um, started a few years ago. It's now part of the thing, everyday thinking. That is how you can get in touch with me. And now I'll zap over to the chat and see what questions have come through. Um, and thank you, I will just say to the person who um, said they met me some time ago, I'm glad to hear that it helped. Um, now a question that's come in, um, trying to describe people who are not cisgender is the term trans or sexually gender diverse. Um, sexual diverse seems to refer more to sexual orientation. Um, so, yeah, I'd perhaps just go with trans and gender diverse or transgender diverse non-binary is usually the ones we would like. Um, we're also okay that if you want to, if you have to write a document or you're writing a communication policy or a press release, putting trans and gender diverse and then TGD in brackets and using the abbreviation afterwards, standard grammatical stuff is fine there. Um, why did mental health professionals want to fix us? Yes, um, help us be ourselves, not changes to something else. I would agree with that. Um, yeah, change can be slow. Well, yeah, hopefully today, this is something, it's a good point to raise. Hopefully now we've got, um, as I look at how many people are on the call, about another 20 um, or 25 or so allies who can just spread the word. Being allies is sometimes, a, one way you can do that is to create more allies with some of the tips that we mentioned, have mentioned. Um, yep, lots of good sex worker um, um, groups there mentioned from around the country. And yeah, thank you um, for um, saying that you, I'm glad you've learned this. I just say one thing in any session I like this, I do. All trans people have ever asked is you come and ask us. You've come and asked us. It's so easy. <laughs> uh, it's very much in line with what's happening today. Um, you know, we have what we call a phrase that I heard a couple of years ago, lived expertise, not just experience, expertise. Tap into that expertise and value it. And it's all a win-win. You know, a society, we're better off. Your service can run more effectively. And society's better off because our mental health gets better and we're not hopefully or hopefully a little less dependent on welfare and other things. Um, how to stop discrimination by health services, especially when physical health issues are ignored? That's a good question there, Ali. Um, 
I think I'll take the answer by saying there's both carrots and a stick. Um, carrots is saying that, um, you know, and then I suppose all points in between carrots is saying, well, we want, we need to do the right thing. We need to be respectful of people and value diversity. Um, you can then do a one that's a half a carrot, half a stick and say, well, you know, this is a risk management exercise. If we discriminate, someone could take us to the Victorian Civil and the relative Civil and Administrative Appeals Tribunal and that takes time and costs money or they could take us further to court. And then you can say, well, we have this law that we mentioned, the federal and relevant state and territory anti-discrimination laws and try to call people in. And I'm a believer that most people, and I'm willing to say around three quarters, want to do the right thing. They may not have um, ever been able to um, think about it. Um, and also physical health issues, yeah, be aware of things like that anyone assigned male at birth you know, will always have a little bit of prostate. Um, so, um, we will need to be get our prostate checked. That sort of diversity is important. So yeah, um, I'm happy, you know, I don't have to race off for a few minutes. So people have a few more questions, pop them in. Otherwise, as said, we can get them funneled through to me and go from there. So um, thank you. Uh, you're all very welcome for all the, um, the learnings. I hope it's given people a, um, Kickstart. I'd also say that if you have any aged care anywhere, if you know of people who have aged care, we have some, um, you know, sort of um, funding we get to do LGBTI aged care training where we can do more at a very low cost. Otherwise, um, you know, still get in touch with me and Transgender Victoria for other ways you can do more training. And also, if it's a quick question, where I'm always happy to do a quick phone call or, th or something, or review a document. Sometimes, you know, when you review it, do a document, they make it more inclusive, and that's important because it is the whole service. You know, so things like saying, regardless of gender, rather than men and women, or all genders is even better. Um, sometimes you can overlook things, we all do that, and I'm happy if you've got a quick three-page document that you're trying to make more inclusive, to just be the quick once over or one of our team can be, we're really happy with that. So yeah, lots of things we can do, um, which were, as always, in the words of Back to the Future, if only we had more time, Marty. Um, you know, but we're out of time, I think we've gone over, but um, yeah, happy to stay on for a few more minutes and have conversations and take questions. Thank you, Sally. I think I can say on behalf of everyone here, uh, that was extremely inspiring and really informative. Um, but yeah, as Sally said, if, the, if anyone does have any questions after this webinar, um, which I'm sure people will, please do send them through either to the reception uh, email address or you can send it through to mine, which is uh, emily.may at bimiac.org.au. Um, and then I can pass them on to Sally and we can yeah, funnel, funnel the answers through. But thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. Pleasure. So if there's not any more questions, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you all so much for joining as well.